You remember those 12 Thai soccer boys who go cave exploring and get stuck two miles into the cave while it floods from the monsoon rain? The way they get them out is so crazy, so incredible, so ghoulish, that if you don't immediately know what I'm talking about, you don't know the full story. Doi Nang Non is known as the Mountain of the Sleeping Lady. Tam Long Nang Non is a complex cave system beneath Doi Nang Non. The mountain range sits on the border between Thailand and Myanmar. The cave system is 6.2 miles long with deep recesses, narrow passages and long winding tunnels hundreds of feet deep. From July to November, a sign is posted at the entrance of the cave to warn about possible flooding from monsoon rain. On Saturday the 23rd of June 2018, 12 boys aged 11 to 16 from the local football team and their 25 year old assistant coach enter the cave to explore before one of the boys has a birthday party later that evening. Early monsoon rain starts to fill the cave trapping the boys and their coach. At 7pm the team's head coach checks his phone to find numerous missed calls from worried parents who don't know why their children aren't back from practice. The coach starts calling each of the boys' phones until he reaches one of the boys who explains that he didn't go with to the cave. The coach heads up to the cave where he finds the boys' bicycles and a stream of water flowing into the cave. He immediately alerts the authorities. Vern Unsworth is a British caver living in Chiang Rai immediately south of the cave. He's actually preparing for a solo expedition into the cave when he gets a call about the missing boys. He advises the Thai government to request assistance from the British Cave Rescue Council who have a network of volunteers experienced in cave rescues. Two days after the boys go missing, Thai Navy SEAL divers arrive on the scene and start to search the caves. The rainwater flowing into the cave is so murky, even with dive lights they can't see their hand in front of their face. The monsoon rain continues to pour water into the cave and the search has to be stopped. Between the 27th and 29th of June, specialist teams of rescue personnel arrive from all over the world, including three British cave rescue divers, US Air Force teams of special tactics and rescue squadrons, Australian police divers, a team of divers from China and other cave divers who live in Thailand and want to help. Everyone wants to help and everyone has a plan. Sniffer dogs are used to try and find sinkholes above ground that could be used to enter the cave in different locations. Two British cave rescue divers, Richard Stanton and John Volanthan, start to provide some structure to the search inside the tunnels. They begin by setting cave lines to guide them through the labyrinth of submerged caves. They also bring hayphone radios which work by hammering antenna spikes into the ground so that radio communications are relayed through the ground between antennas set every few hundred feet. But the search is slow going. The non-stop rain creates currents and poor visibility underwater and the search has to be called off for a number of days. Above ground, water pumps are extracting water from the cave and teams of people are working to divert rainwater before it runs into the cave. It's a simple strategy but not easy to achieve. Local farmers are asked if the water being pumped out can run into their fields. There's nowhere else for it to go. This will cost them their annual crops a heavy price to pay for farmers who rely on the food they harvest. But the boys in the cave could be their family, so they agree without question. The water is pumped into gutters made of bamboo that run down the mountain into the farmer's fields. By the 2nd of July, the weather improves slightly and the divers go back in the water. Spearheading the dive team are Stanton and Valanthan. They are the ones setting the dive lines for others to follow. They're effectively mapping the way. Stanton and Valanthan are assisted by Robert Harper at Base Camp. Base Camp is a search and rescue station established one and a half miles into the cave. This is as far into the cave they can go without scuba equipment. At around 2200, Stanton and Valanthan find the boys. They're on a narrow rock shelf about 1300 feet beyond Pattaya Beach Chamber, which is about one mile from base camp or two and a half miles from the entrance of the cave. Valanthan finds them as he gets to the end of a cave line he's setting. He ties off the end of the line, then surfaces to check the chamber above water. He takes off his mask. He can smell the boys. 
Valanthan's camera captures the boys' reaction as they see the diver. Stanton and Valanthan assure the boys they'll come back for them, then head back to base camp and on to the entrance of the cave. On the 3rd of July, 10 days after the boys went into the cave, three Navy SEALs join the boys with food, medicine, and space blankets. It takes almost six hours to reach them from the entrance of the cave. They'll stay with the boys until a rescue plan is put in place, and one of them is a doctor who checks the boys out. They make a video of the boys and let them write notes on dive slates to send to their parents. In their assessments of the situation, they learned that a number of the boys can't swim, but they kept themselves busy by digging a tunnel. They've made it 15 feet in 10 days. Over the coming days, the rescuers build dams upstream to divert water from entering the cave and place pumps in the cave which extract millions of gallons of water enough to fill 400 Olympic-sized swimming pools. By the 5th of July, the water level in the cave has dropped enough for rescuers to walk most of the way to base camp without having to swim or wade through water. But heavy rain is predicted for the 8th of July, and so the clock is ticking to get the boys out. Inside the cave, oxygen levels are dropping. The boys need between 19 and 23% oxygen to maintain normal function. The levels are reaching 15%, which is starting to pose a danger to the boys. Thai military engineers consider an air supply pipeline, but they abandon the idea because it's just not practical. The governor of the province now has a hard decision to make. There are loose plans from multiple agencies on how to get the boys out. He considers three plans that have the best base to work from, but not without their faults. One option is to accurately pinpoint the boys' location and dig a tunnel to reach them. The problem is they're over half a mile deep through mountain rock and it'll take a significant amount of time to dig a tunnel. With monsoon season already on them, time is not something they have. They could support the boys and bring them back out after the monsoon season passes in November, but with oxygen levels dropping and no practical way to replenish the oxygen, not to mention the rainwater could rise to a point that they drown anyway, that plan seems like a last resort. The only real option he has is to dive them out as quickly as possible ahead of more flooding. On the face of it, it seems like a logical plan. The boys get some scuba equipment, go for a dive, and then walk out of the cave. But diving is not a straightforward skill to learn. It's simple enough to get the basics, but to be proficient enough to go cave diving is something else entirely. When an inexperienced diver panics, their reaction is to pull their mask off, pull their regulator out of their mouth, and try to swim for the surface. I've experienced this several times with student divers who are learning to dive in a pool. This is a cave with underwater sections leading through tunnels. If anyone panics underwater, they almost certainly get into trouble. The tunnels have tight squeezes where a diver needs to take off his equipment and pass it through ahead of himself. A tricky move for an experienced cave diver. And that's precisely the location a rescue diver bringing them out would have the least amount of control over the boys. Stanton and Valanthan have an idea about how to keep the boys from panicking, but first they have to solve a logistical problem. An inexperienced diver will consume about three times as much air as an experienced diver. The air cylinders to dive the boys out need to be delivered into the cave by divers. The divers themselves need their own supply of tanks, and so this becomes a logistical operation of bringing tanks, equipment, and food to base camp one and a half miles into the cave. At the entrance of the cave are thousands of people. Many of these people are assisting the operation by catering for almost 10,000 people who are involved in the wider operation. Hundreds of these people are carrying equipment to base camp like a Sherpa might carry supplies for a climber. They have to descend the slippery slopes of the cave, wade through pools of water, and climb out the other side, all while carrying diving cylinders and rescue equipment. At base camp, there are hundreds of people. Some of them are rescue personnel like divers and medics, and some will return to the entrance of the cave with empty dive tanks to be filled. Base camp amasses around 500 cylinders with a further 200 in rotation to be filled at the entrance of the cave. Only divers go beyond this point. First, they walk down a steep slope. Then they dive through a submerged tunnel that's only wide enough for one person to push his scuba gear through. They climb out and walk again to another staging area. 
At the secondary staging area, the divers are accumulating dive tanks to continue the push deeper through the next submerged tunnel. They also bring dive gear for the boys like wetsuits and masks. A rescue operation relies on control. Control over the environment, control over safety, and self-control. Typically, during a high-stress rescue, if the rescuer loses control of one of these aspects, the situation gets worse. At the surface, they're controlling the rainwater by pumping it into the fields. If that fails, the cave starts filling with water. In the cave, they're controlling the environment by setting guidelines and climbers are setting pulley structures to get the boys up the steep slopes of the cave and over crevices they'd like to avoid. They control the safety for the boys by providing wetsuits to keep their body temperature from dropping while they're in the water. Each diver that goes into the cave must also have self-control. They're in a confined space and the added workload of carrying extra equipment increases their breathing rate. If you're not in control over your own actions and you lose control over safety or the environment, the situation can spiral. One of the divers is a Thai Navy diver named Saman Kunan. During a dive on the 5th of July, Kunan dives three cylinders through the first submerged tunnel to the secondary staging area. He then begins his return to base camp. Before he gets to the narrowest section of the tunnel, he gets disorientated and before he can calm himself and find the cave line, he runs out of air and loses consciousness. His dive buddy tries to resuscitate him, then brings him through the tunnel to base camp where medics take over. They aren't able to save him. This demonstrates that a highly experienced diver can lose control and it cost him his life. The young boys have never scuba dived. Some can't swim. They're weak and traumatized. The chances of them panicking are very high. And this is the reason Jason Mallinson, a British cave rescue diver said, they're confident they can get them out, but not confident they can get them out alive. Over the next days, the preparations continue. With Kunan's death still on their minds, the Thai Navy SEALs practice in a local school pool. They recreate the tight passageways using plastic chairs and work with boys from the school. Their plan is to pass the boys from one side to divers on the other side of the narrowest sections. The boys have volunteered to learn how to scuba dive because they want to help. They're strong boys, confident swimmers, and they're struggling. Valanthan, Stanton, and Mallinson have recovered people from caves before. They've seen people panic and they know the submerged cave is far more treacherous than other caves they've worked in before. They've been talking about a way to get the boys out without them panicking, but it's never been done before. They don't have time to waste and so they set their plan in motion. They still need to convince the governor, but they also have to convince Richard Harris. Belanthan and Stanton ask Harris to help them with the recovery, but they don't tell him why until he arrives at the cave. Harris is an Australian volunteer cave rescue diver, but his primary occupation is anesthesiology. Harris listens to the plan and immediately refuses. As a doctor, he's taken the Hippocratic Oath. What they're asking him to do puts the boys, his reputation, and his conscience at risk. Harris grapples with the thought of using anesthetics to sedate the boys in order to dive them out. He understands the risk of the boys panicking if they try to dive them out conscious, but he also understands the risks of sedating them. The boys can't stay in the cave and the only option is to dive them out. If they panic in the tight squeezes underwater, they almost certainly die and the chances of them panicking are very high. He wonders how many will panic and die. Two, three, ten, who knows? Then he considers the risks of anesthetic. When a patient is put under anesthetic for an operation, he has a team of doctors and nurses to assist if something goes wrong. Patients can have adverse reactions to certain types of anesthetic. That means it's not a one-size-fits-all. A patient in an operating theater is given a constant level of anesthetic to keep them under sedation until the operation is finished. It can cause a drop in core body temperature, and it can cause a patient to salivate. These boys are going into cold water, so a drop in their core temperature could kill them. If they salivate and swallow their own saliva, they could drown. And unlike an operating theater, they're going to pass through underwater tunnels, which means they can only be topped up periodically, and if they wake up underwater, it would spell disaster. Realistically, there's only one form of anesthetic they can use, 
ketamine. Ketamine is the only anesthetic that won't reduce the boy's body temperature. But if a boy has an adverse reaction, there's no other anesthetic they can use and it's certainly not a controlled environment like a hospital with all the facilities they need to deal with an adverse reaction. Unfortunately, Harris doesn't have the luxury of time to plan and control all possible outcomes. And if he doesn't move forward with this plan, then it's almost certain some of the boys will drown. Now, Harris and the other cave rescue divers must convince the governor. Since they arrived, the rescue divers have built some credibility. They brought the hay phones, which have been used extensively to communicate with base camp. They've set the guidelines and they found the boys. The Thai Navy SEALs are concerned with the boys panicking in the pool. And so like Harris, the governor agrees that while it's dangerous, it's also the plan that has the best possible outcome. The plan is set in motion. There's a media blackout and only rescuers on a need to know basis are given full details. Not even the boys' parents are told. They have to get all the boys out before anyone questions their methods. The governor recognizes that it could end badly and so he gives the medical team diplomatic immunity. On the 8th of July, the divers descend into the cave. They pass through base camp and then dive through the two submerged tunnels. Harris calls the first boy over. The Thai Navy SEALs know the plan, but the boys don't. They don't want to scare the boys. Can you imagine knowing you'll be unconscious while someone drags you through an underwater tunnel? The Thai Navy SEALs keep the other boys occupied while Harris and the rescue divers get the boys kitted up. The boys have decided who goes first. It's a plan they made early in the process because they wanted the boys who lived furthest from the cave to get out first so they could ride their bicycles home and they've got the furthest to go. We know that's not realistic, but the boys have made their decisions and it makes sense to stick with their plan. And all the boys are healthy, so there's no reason to change the plan. They get the first boy into a wetsuit. This will keep him warm enough. If his core body temperature drops too much, it will slow his heart rate. They can't monitor his vital signs during the dive, so they need to eliminate possible problems. Harris gives him an injection based on his body weight. The concoction has ketamine to sedate him, atropine to steady his heart rate and slow his saliva production and alprazolam to keep him calm. He watches to make sure the boy is okay and then Valanthin continues to kit him up. Valanthin puts a harness on the boy with a strap that's connected to his own equipment so he can't float out of reach. A weight belt to counteract the positive buoyancy from the wetsuit, a BCD which is an inflatable jacket to control his buoyancy, a dive tank with 80% oxygen so he has his own oxygen rich breathing supply and finally a full face dive mask. Once all the equipment is fitted and the boy is breathing normally, they lower him face first into the water. Philanthon checks to make sure the boy is breathing properly which he can tell from the stream of bubbles coming out the regulator as he exhales. He signals to Harris that everything's okay, then he and the boy descend into the murky water. Philanthon checks again to make sure his package is breathing. The divers decided to think of the boys as a package that needs to be transported. The thought of them dying while under their care is so overwhelming that they need a way to distance themselves from the emotion of the operation. Then he grabs the boy's harness with one hand and holds the dive line in the other and starts on the journey that's just under a mile long. As they work their way through the tunnel, Philanthon will have to manage the boy's buoyancy. Philanthon lets go of the boy's harness and adds some air to his BCD to neutralize his buoyancy, a process he will repeat many times over the next few hours during the extraction, putting air in while they descend and letting air out while they ascend. Philanthon also has to manage the air in his own BCD. This is an awkward but necessary task of holding the dive line and the strap attached to the boy's harness with one hand and using the other to work the inflator on his own and the boy's BCD. Luckily, the submerged sections of the cave are quite shallow. That's why the cave flooded so quickly. It also means they don't have to worry about equalizing the boy's eustachian tubes. Philanthon navigates his package through the narrow tunnel. He's careful not to get the boy's dive mask caught on the rocks of the cave. 
The mask is a positive pressure mask, which means if it gets bumped slightly, it will fill with air and force back any water trying to get in. But if the mask is pulled entirely away from the boy's face, it will flood. Philanthon holds his package slightly below his own head height. That way, he will bump his own head first rather than bumping the boys. The first submerged section is the easiest to navigate. It's wide enough for Valanthan to keep hold of the boy the whole way through the tunnel. Valanthan and his assistant rescue diver ascend with the package into the staging chamber between the two submerged sections of tunnel. They're met by a team of divers. A doctor checks on the boy while other divers change out all the dive tanks. The doctor is concerned. The boy's heart rate has dropped to a point where it's barely perceptible. His top-up dose is adjusted and they continue to the next submerged tunnel. They put the boy on a stretcher and carry him to the water's edge. Philanthon goes into the water and the rescuers bring the boy in after him. They kit him up and check he's breathing. Then Valanthan, his support diver and the package descend into the narrow tunnel. Slowly but surely, they make their way to the deepest point of the submerged tunnel. He stops periodically to look or feel for air bubbles and reassure himself the boy is still breathing. As he starts the ascent up into the next chamber, the support diver goes first. Then Valanthan pushes the package up through the tight squeeze ahead of him. The support diver receives the package, then he lets a little air out of the boy's BCD to neutralize his buoyancy and waits for Valanthan. Valanthan squeezes through the tight section and the three of them ascend to base camp. They're met by a team of rescue personnel. Once again, a doctor checks the boy. His breathing and heart rates are weak, but stable. Valanthan breathes a sigh of relief. The boy is strapped into a stretcher for the next part of his journey. Luckily, the water has subsided a little, which makes it easier to navigate. The boy is passed along a daisy chain of rescue workers. They bypass some of the steeper and deeper chasms by hanging the stretcher into a pulley system set up by climbers. They pull the stretcher over these sections and once again the boy is passed hand to hand by hundreds of people. He's carried along the final stretch as the cave opening starts to level out. Over three days, all the boys and their coach are brought out of the cave in the same way. From the time the rescuers first arrived, it took five or more hours to make the journey from base camp to the entrance. By the time the last boy left the cave, that was down to one hour through experience and because of the amount of water that was pumped out of the cave. In true Hollywood style, as the coach who was the last to be brought out, the rain started up and the pumps failed, causing the water in the cave to start rising rapidly. The last rescuers had to run out of the cave, leaving rescue equipment in the cave to be recovered after monsoon season passed. The boys in their coach were taken to the hospital in Chiang Rai where they made a full recovery. Almost a year later, a Thai Navy diver died from a blood infection he got in the cave. In February 2023, the captain of the football team died from a head injury in the UK where he had been given a scholarship to study. It looks like he tripped and hit his head in his dorm. He was 17 years old.